Welcome back for another Reading Bug author interview with Mike Lowry, author of Everything Awesome About Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Creatures. I know you're all listening to your favorite past adventures, aren't you? And I promise we're busy writing a whole new season of music and adventures for you. But today, and for the next few weeks, I wanted to introduce you to a few of our favorite authors and illustrators. Today's author visit is brought to you by Reading Bug Box, our perfectly personalized subscription box service. That's right, Reading Bug. Every box includes a unique selection of books and extras that are unique to each child's age and interests. Visit readingbugbox.com and be sure to let us know upon sign-up that you're a podcast fan. The Reading Bug and I will be sure to write you a special note in your first box. You can also learn all about us and our independent bookstore in California by visiting thereadingbug.com. I know many of you love dinosaurs because we've been told our dinosaur adventure is one of your very favorites. So today's interview should be a treat. Mike Lowry is an author who knows even more about dinosaurs than we do. His book, Everything Awesome About Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Creatures, is full of more dinosaurs than we ever knew existed. It sure is. I loved reading it, and I can't wait for more Everything Awesome books. Well, you're in luck then, Reading Bug, because I heard there's more on the way. Speaking of on the way, where is Mike anyways? Oh, he's not visiting us today in person, Reading Bug. Mike's joining us by computer. And look, here he is. Hi, Mike. Oh, yes. Hello, Mike. Oh, hello, Reading Bug. Reading Bug? Reader? Are you ready? Okay, then. It's time for a Reading Bug author visit. I am here today with Mike Lowry, author and illustrator of the new book, Everything Awesome About Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Beasts. Mike has written and collaborated on many books, including the New York Times bestselling series, Mac B. Kid Spy, written by Mac Barnett, who we interviewed just a few weeks ago, and countless other books. And Mike, I want to thank you so much for joining me and The Reading Bug today. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Good to have you here on our computer. It is very good to be here with you. Thank you. So, Mike, we uh, have a lot to talk about because it looks like you've created an enormous amount of art over the years. So (laughs) can you um, start by telling us just a little bit about where this career began? Oh, yeah, sure. So I uh, when I was in elementary school, I started I mean, I guess everybody was kind of drawing right when they're real young. Everybody starts drawing and then eventually some people just kind of lose interest in it. But at some point in elementary school, I think maybe one of my parents or uh, grandparents looked over my shoulder at something that I was drawing and was probably like, oh, that that's okay. That seems pretty good. And that was a compliment enough. And <laughs> I liked the feeling of that compliment. So I just kind of kept drawing for you know the rest of my life, I guess. Uh, so I started by drawing comic strips in elementary school. And in high school, I really wanted to do newspaper comics. And ended up going to college for graphic design because it was the 90s. And if you're an artist in the 90s, you're supposed to do graphic design. And did painting and graphic design. And then slowly over the years, uh, I always really liked kids' books. And so I would make my own kids' books as a kid. And I would draw kind of weird, funny kids' books in high school and college. And didn't really know that much about the business of it. Anyway, so then... Uh, the older I got, the more my graphic design started to just look like uh, sketchbook drawing, playful, funny stuff. And then eventually I sent some of my stuff to one of the publishers uh, that I had been looking at for a while. And they said, hey, would you be interested in illustrating this book uh, that somebody else wrote? And I said, yeah, okay, I guess I could do that. That's kind of like the <laughs> quick version. Yeah. 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 So you, you started as an illustrator and then it seems like you've moved into writing a lot of your own books too. Is there one that you like better than the other or? Um, well, yeah. So I got, I always wanted to do um, the writing and illustration, but when I first started, I didn't really know how it worked. And so I didn't know that you could just illustrate. I thought you had to write and illustrate. So I sent out a bunch of um, book ideas, this one particular book idea, but um, it, it, it wasn't really written. I mean, I, I had just come up with a bunch of characters and I 
just put a little bit of text to it, thinking that that's kind of what I needed to do. Cause I, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't know that much about it, but, um, yeah, so I sent a bunch of those out and got a lot of feedback on the art that people really liked. And mm -hmm. then really just made a career of doing that, just illustrating other people's books. But then slowly editors started asking me about my own stories, my own ideas and things like that. And uh, I started pitching some of these ideas that I'd had for a really long time, like the book that you have now, the everything awesome about dinosaurs. I mean, really, it just it collects all of these weird things that I've always really liked about dinosaurs into one book. So, um, nice. yeah, so that's kind of how that happened. So in terms of writing and illustrating, I mean, of course I like writing my own books, but I, I also really like illustrating books for other people too. That can be a lot of fun. Is it a bigger challenge to illustrate for somebody else? Does it make you nervous or? Um, I think that both of them have their pros and cons. I mean, writing a book like this, um, I found myself, uh, I found myself really having to sit down and uh, concentrate on the writing part of it, which is not something that I had. It's not a skill that I had really trained myself to do in a long time. So this had a lot of research to it. Uh, whereas illustrating for somebody else, I can just kind of sit down and start penciling stuff out and drawing. And um, But both of them, you know, sometimes it's with this, it's totally my vision. And I get to think about the way that the dinosaurs look and I get to make little jokes on the side, like um, there's a part in the book where it talks about how the word dinosaur comes from the the phrase terrible lizard, like it comes through that. And so I, I got to write a little joke about one dinosaur sort of being offended that he would be called terrible. And then another dinosaur oh. is saying, well, you you know, you did eat my brother. So <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know. I like that kind of writing a lot. I like taking nonfiction stuff and then getting to write little jokes with it. Sure. So, and you, you, um, I've been told carry a sketchbook wherever you go. Can you, um, tell me a little bit about what's in your sketchbook or maybe what some of the ideas that you put in there, maybe for the dinosaur book or anything that's really fun that's in there right now? Yeah. So this book actually came out of my sketchbook. So I do keep a sketchbook with me all the time mm -hmm. and I've carried one for about a little over 20 years now, I guess. And it was something that, um, early on, my grandmother really kind of pushed for me to keep a sketchbook and I would draw, you know, comic book characters and things like that. Um, but then starting, uh, in 1998, I had a, a teacher in college who, uh, suggested keeping a sketchbook every day. So that was like the 20 year mark, right. That I started keeping one and, uh, I have kept it on trips and I make little notes and I make little jokes. I write things down maybe for projects for later. And at one point I read this fact that a chicken nugget had sold on eBay for $8,000. <laughs> Would you like to guess why it sold for $8,000? Oh my gosh. I, I don't think I could even begin to. It sold for $8,000 because it looked like George Washington. Oh, I think I did hear about that. Yeah. That's ridiculous. So I thought that was kind of insane and I thought it'd be a funny thing to draw and I couldn't think of what to draw the day. So I just drew it out. And then I just started drawing any kind of weird fact like that, that I would find. And what I found was that a lot of these weird facts that I was drawing, a lot of the things that I found the most interesting centered around like these specific topics. And so I started thinking about what would be a topic that would have a lot of weird stuff. And I started uh -huh. just drawing a lot of dinosaurs. Like, I've always really liked dinosaurs. Uh, so I started doing a lot of drawings about weird dinosaur facts. And so this whole project really came like right out of a sketchbook, but I like to draw when we travel, I like to draw, you know, weird food that we try, you know, weird to me. And then I, I write comics about people that we meet and things that happen like, um, on, on one flight, my daughter's name is Alistair. Uh -huh. Um, and we were taking a flight home from England and we had a, uh, flight attendant from England and, you know, Alistair is kind of a unique name for a girl. And mm -hmm. uh, so she kept calling her Valerie and she was making a point of letting us know that she's so good at being a flight attendant that she knows all the passengers by name. And she kept <laughs> calling my daughter Valerie uh, <laughs> and she's real proud of herself for remembering. And so anyway, so I, I like drawing little comics and stuff because I'll, I'll forget it otherwise. Uh, sure. So I like uh, having that comic about Valerie in there. 
<laughs> so when you, um, it sounds like you do sketch and draw all the time, but what, uh, do, do you, are you one of those artists that will just wake up in the middle of the night with a crazy idea from a dream or do you tend to work within your work hours? Well, that's changed a lot. Uh, so throughout college and through early in my twenties and my early thirties, I, I really, I would stay up. I, I would teach during the day. I was, uh, uh, I taught illustration at the Savannah college of art and design for a long time and a few colleges before that. And so I would teach during the day and then I would come home and I would rest and kind of take a nap during the day. And then I would start working at like 10 o'clock at night and I would work through the night, usually it's about five or six in the morning. And then I would go to work. And I loved it because it was nighttime and there was, you know, nobody could message me and there was nothing to take care of. There was no errands to run. I had to just sit and work and I really liked it. But then, you know, things kind of change and now I get sort of tired. And uh, so now I end up working a lot during the day. So if I, if I think of something at night, I'll, I'll make a note about it. But um, yeah, typically I'll, I'll draw during the day. But my, my wife is a children's book illustrator too. Oh. And so some nights, once the kids are in bed, then we'll kind of sit down in the studio and very romantically, we'll just work until like two in the morning. I know all about that with, with podcast writing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, same thing. Yeah. So, you know, some it's it's a our schedule is a lot more. It's not as set as it was at points, but, uh, you know, I, don't know, I guess we're still able to get a lot of stuff done, which is good. Sure. I think it helps that you know, when you love what you're doing too, I think you can probably do it at any time, but it is hard to set those boundaries when, when you're just working all the time, but uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, tell me more about, um, everything awesome about dinosaurs. I know I mean, there's a ton of work that goes into these books and there's so much in them. Um, how long did it take you to make this one? So, uh, start to finish, uh, from the time we sort of, uh, my first meeting was Scholastic where they, they said that they liked the idea and they wanted to go move forward with it. Um, it took, I would say about a year to get it really finished. I'm not sure exactly, but there was a long window at the very beginning where we did a lot of research and well, I did a lot of research and then would send stuff over to them. And I was working in this way that I had worked in the past where I would do a little bit of drawing, a little bit of research, a little bit of drawing research, and then kind of go back and forth. And, uh, but we really wanted this book to be really accurate. You know, uh, it, like I said, it started in a sketchbook and if you're doing something in a sketchbook, you can get a rough idea of what is fact and what is not. And you can start kind of making drawings about it because there's not a lot at stake. But when I decided that, or when we decided, when I worked, talked this over with Scholastic and we decided to make it like just this really dense book that would have everything in it that, you know, a kid that was excited about dinosaurs or a kid that would be excited about anything nonfiction or just, I don't know, comics or whatever, make the book for them. We decided we, we really wanted it to be just full of 100% totally bona fide factual stuff. And so I started the way that I had been working and then realized pretty quickly that I was going to need to sit down and really get the research done first. So, uh, yeah, so I, I went and started looking at just any really respected book about dinosaurs that I could find. And I started going through and thinking about what do I find to be the most interesting and weird and crazy and like funny stuff about dinosaurs. And I started kind of collecting all that stuff together and then started writing out in my voice, you know, what, how I would kind of talk to somebody else about dinosaurs. And it, and it became kind of easy because I just like this stuff anyway. So this is the way that I talk. I mean, the book, it's like, I mean, I guess it is written in a sense, but it's the character of the book is like, it's, this is the way that I talk, right? Sure. It's like, I'm excited about dinosaurs. I think that they're, I like weird facts and stuff. So um, the tone of the book is just the way that I talk in general. I think that's really important for an author. Actually, I, I think that's, uh, you know, having your own voice in there because then it's just, it's more authentic and the kids relate to it better. And it's, it's funny that you should say that about your work. Well, not necessarily funny, but um, because when you worked with Mac Barnett, the way he writes, he writes in his own voice too. You can almost hear him, um, you know, speaking the book, especially with Mac B Kids Buy. And then you working on that book as well. You got, you, you know, in a way you got to put your own voice in there too, but in the pictures. Yeah. And I, 
I think that that's one thing that I really, so I, Mac knows this and he and I have met a few times and, um, uh, he's one of those writers that I really like, uh, when, whenever I get manuscripts in for somebody else's books, I of course sit down and if it's a chapter book or whatever, of course, I, the first thing that I need to do is sit down and read the whole thing. And, uh, so that I can make sure that I build all the characters correctly and everything. And I read a ton of chapter books. I read a ton of picture books and stuff like that. I mean, it's just like the world that I'm in. And I was actually recently asked, uh, by some, some friends if I wanted to be in a, a book club with them. And I said that I, that I could, but uh, all of the books that I'm going to suggest right now are going to be like kids chapter books and teen reader books or whatever. That's the best and kind for any book club. I, I think. I, know. Yes. I think so too. <laughs> I think, I think book people think that, but then when I suggested, it, I don't know that they were <laughs> on board. Um, and then I suggested a book called everything awesome about dinosaurs and other prehistoric beasts yes. for this book club. And they could, you know, it was just me promoting. I was trying to sell an extra like eight copies of my book. That's the way to do it. Um, so, uh, yeah, but reading, I was reading through Max manuscripts uh, early on. And it's rare that I would just kind of laugh out loud. And it's and it's like real subtle jokes in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I like, I like his voice through those a lot. And it worked well with me kind of getting to draw in this playful uh, kind of just this like sort of playful style for his books. Sure. So you are going to be touring for uh, everything awesome about dinosaurs around the country. But um, it, when you visit schools, and I know you visited schools with past books, have you um, w- have you got any questions that were hard for you to answer um, that kids asked from the audience? Um, hard to answer questions. So some questions that I get a lot are, how old are you? Mm-hmm. And... I always say, you know, like, I'm happy to answer that. I just don't know that the interest that the information is going to be that interesting once right. you hear it. Uh, I get, uh, how much do you make? A lot. Yes. Are you rich? And, um, you know, I think that my, um, like, Chanel jumpsuit that I wear. Oh. Um, does, Chanel, does Chanel make clothes? Are they just perfume? They, they no, make clothes, they do right? make clothes. They do. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought, uh, I thought that would give it away. Like, you know, how wealthy I am. Of course. I don't think that the kids are as aware (laughs) of brands. So I bring a Hydro Flask because that is something that they know now. (laughs) It's true. Um, and I wear checkered vans. Yes. Because, you know, because you have an 11 year old. Uh, She is in her checkered vans today. Oh, my daughter is 12. So she's wearing a scrunchie and, Mm -hmm. uh, she's described she told me what a visco girl is i don't know oh, that's i don't new. remember uh because <laughs> i i zoned out a little bit when she was telling me but um so let's see so hard questions would be i don't know i don't know that i've had any hard questions i think that i get a lot uh you know how can i get good at drawing and and mm-hmm. a, a lot of the teachers and whenever um um there's parents that are there or librarians and stuff uh, sitting in the back a lot of them will say, you know, I've got a kid who really likes to draw. How can they get good at drawing or get into drawing? And I mean, I don't know. The one thing that I bring up a lot is, uh, is to keep a sketchbook. I, for years, that's the focus of my presentation that I would give would be about keeping a sketchbook. Mm-hmm. I think it's real important. I feel like I, I don't know. I bring that up a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What other, what do you think a hard, what do you think a hard question? Give me like a oh, hard hitting question. Let me see how I take it. Give me a zinger. Oh, that's hard. Well, okay. Are you ready? What is your mm-hmm. favorite color? Uh, grayish blue oh. and orange. I like a muted orange and a grayish blue. Uh, See, I thought that would you? be What's hard. I thought that would be hard for an author to decide what their favorite color is because there are so many out there. But that's that was a good quick answer. I um, my favorite color is blue, but that's not very okay. specific, is it? I guess let's go with turquoise blue. <laughs> well. Yeah, but you say favorite color, and I guess, I don't know, I'm going to be picky now. I guess I feel like when you say favorite, I just think, well, what do I end up using a lot in my art? And I feel like grayish blue comes up a lot. I I feel like it's like a safety color. Like, it's just something I'm real comfortable with. And, okay, would you like to hear an interesting fact about the author who you're interviewing? Um, I wear the same shirt every day. 
not the same shirt. Like I wear a clean version of the same shirt every day. Oh, so you're one of those that has them lined up in your closet? Uh-huh. I oh. well, I have slight variations on the same thing, which okay. is like just this this t-shirt. And those tend to be either navy blue or like gray. Those are like and like your color palette in many of your books. That's, That's very right. interesting. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So you are consistent. More hard questions. Yeah, zingers. your favorite your favorite food. Oh, that one is a tough one. That okay. That's that is, you know, because I don't want to say something like ramen and then, uh, you know, then there'd be something like um, uh, curry cauliflower that would hear me say that about ramen and then would get its feelings hurt. Do you know what I mean? That is a challenge. So what's the weirdest food you ever eaten? Oh, I've eaten some weird food. Uh, I have eaten. So I don't eat a lot of like weird meat stuff anymore, but. I have eaten. Um, oh, let me let me let me ins instead of answering that, let me. I'm going to give you a little anecdote, a little okay. side story. So one day uh, I was at a school and I asked the kids what their favorite foods were, and you know I got a lot of hot dog and pizza and things like that. And then I said, "What's your least favorite food?" And this was a third grade class, mm -hmm. and one kid said. I said, what's, what's your least favorite food? And one kid said, horse meat, really loudly. Ooh. And I thought it was really funny. I thought it was really well delivered, you know, and one of the teachers was like, no, no, hey, it's just Jonathan, you know, be, you got to keep it down. And I, but I, it has really stayed with me. That it was years ago <laughs> that this kid came up with like such a quick joke and said horse meat that quickly. I thought that was pretty good. It's a smart kid, I think. There's a lot of smart, a smart ones kid. out there. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. All right, um, let's let's talk about dinosaurs a little bit more because I just another question. I I want to know what your favorite dinosaur is. Maybe it's one that no one would know about. Okay. So uh so, yeah, so um I really it's I don't know. It's one of these things where I think that it's tough. I think maybe that's even harder than the favorite color question because there's so many different pieces of dinosaurs that I really like. Mm -hmm. Uh I think I think that it's uh, one that I've re I've really liked recently, only because it has the award for the longest dinosaur name, is the Micropachycephalosaurus. Micropachycephalosaurus. Oh, that was good. Yeah, and yeah. so I feel like that's been good. It's got this, um, it's got this really hard bony dome on the top of its head. Mm -hmm. Uh. And its name actually, in, part of the name means hard-headed lizard, which I feel like is something that like my one of my parents would have called me out of frustration <laughs> in elementary school or something. But um, uh, yeah, so I uh, I really like that because then I get to work in the conversation, you know, Micropachycephalosaurus. I, I mean, I, I don't know, like any of the giant dinosaurs, the sauropods. Uh, like the Diplodocus and you know, the Apatosaurus. Uh, oh, I really liked reading. One part that I really liked in this book was I tried to I tried to start each section by asking questions mm -hmm. to myself, and it, the questions aren't necessarily listed, but I would ask a question to myself, like, "Well, what's what's the biggest dinosaur?" You know, I tried to think about um, something that a, uh, a kid would would want to ask, or something that I would want to ask. And so, anyway, so I started thinking about like what the biggest dinosaur was. And sometimes those questions could be really easy to answer. And sometimes they could be incredibly difficult. Like what the biggest dinosaur of all time is. Mm -hmm. And this one's just really tough because we keep finding pieces of dinosaurs and it's just like, you know, a hip bone or something that then scientists have to kind of piece together about how big that dinosaur would have been. So there's a couple of contenders. Um, and so that, that's kind of interesting. I, one that I did find is like the, the biggest known uh, carnivorous dinosaur is the Spinosaurus. Oh. And, and it, it, it sort of has like this kind of T-Rex look, but has this giant sail on its back. Mm -hmm. And they were really big and they could swim. And so uh, I think that those are pretty cool. Yeah. Mike, have you listened to the Reading Bug Adventures podcast? Believe it or not. Lauren and I adventured back to the Cretaceous period and saw some real live dinosaurs together. We even saw a T-Rex that Lauren had to sing to sleep so that we could escape. We also flew carried by a... Here comes my favorite dinosaur, the Quetzal, Quetzalcoatlus. Uh, Lauren? 
We're trying to oh, get him, yeah. we're trying to get him away from the T Rex, and that was the whole episode. Quetzalcoatlus. So, so the Quetzalcoatlus is. Oh no! Is that how you say it? Yeah, which is, but I think it's close. I mean, I'm probably saying it a little wrong, but uh, I'm got, I'm gonna. I have some news for you now. I don't get to do this often, but I'm going to be the dino expert, not a dinosaur. Quetzalcoatlus, not a dinosaur. Right. It's a pterosaur. Which, um, it's this group that pterodactyls come from, which, uh, is also not a real scientific word, pterodactyl. Mm -hmm. Is this interesting right now? Or it makes me... It's very interesting. And then actually, because, and I I think the good news is, I think the reading bug did mention that somewhere in the episode. You bet I did. Oh, okay, good. She is smarter than I am when it comes to, when it comes to our stories. That's for sure. She knows everything because she's read all this in books. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> well, and I think it's just uh, like bugs are generally smarter than humans. And I, I'm not Agreed. sure if you mm-hmm. knew because we we can't see each other right now. I don't know if you could if you knew that I was a tarantula. A what? Yikes. <gasps> oh, mm. it all makes sense. So I can't wait to meet that reading bug because she sounds yeah. delicious. Delicious? Wait, uh oh, she better start running now. <laughs> oh, you were joking. Mike, you scared me for a second there. Speaking of sounding delicious, we have one more thing to talk about because I heard that this is going to be a series, this Everything Awesome series, and the next one might be Sharks? That's right. Yep. The next, I was going to make you guess, but you already knew. You already had all the information. Yeah. So the next one is about Sharks, and I'm actually just now finishing that one up. It comes out early next year, and I'm going to tell you, I like dinosaurs a lot. And I liked sharks, but now I really like sharks. Is there I, a favorite I, shark? Well, I think the one that has gotten kind of known recently is the Megalodon. That's the prehistoric shark. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's the okay. biggest shark ever. Um, in the shark book, we also talk about some stuff that's not just underwater stuff that's not sharks. And I didn't realize that the blue whale was so big. I mean, I knew that it was big, but I didn't realize it was like the biggest living thing ever on this planet. Yeah. And um, so I think there's, there's been some stuff like in the shark book that became really uh, unexpectedly interesting. And, mm-hmm. and it does make you realize how insane the ocean is. And yeah. I don't know. I, it's just, it's so deep. It is a pretty mm-hmm. amazing place. Yeah. I remember that book, um, actually, The Biggest Thing in the Ocean by Kevin Sherry. It was a picture book. It's a great oh, picture yeah. book. Yeah. And so it's true. It really is the biggest thing in the ocean, that whale. Yeah. And the ocean is so deep that um, I was able to talk with my publisher. And, and I did a research trip down to the bottom of the ocean with James Cameron, director James Cameron. You did? No, that's not true. That would be really cool. I'll see, I believe you. No, but I did watch the movie The Abyss, which that I think is it's a documentary, right? Yeah, about for sure. sea yeah. monsters. Definitely not for kids. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> that is a good one, though. <laughs> it's, it's James Cameron's uh, most famous movie, right? I mean, yes. definitely yeah. more popular than Titanic. Avatar and yeah. Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you're working on the shark book now. And then mm-hmm. what is there anything coming up after that that you know about? Yeah, so we're going to do a third one after that mm-hmm. for sure. And then hopefully we'll do like, you know, 60 more, I guess. That would be um, a lot. And yeah, do you would you like to guess what the topic? So the first one is dinosaurs. The mm-hmm. third, the second one is sharks. Do you want to take a guess at what the third one's about? Yes, let's see. Um, hmm. Snakes. No, it's a no. great. That is a great. There are some snakes in the shark book because there's some uh, sh- uh, snakes that live near or in water. But no, mm. not a, not an all snake book. How about chimpanzees? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I don't know why I laughed. I'm sorry. It's uh, so funny. No, no bad guesses here. I'm sorry for laughing. That's okay. That's all right. I'll, it's I can take not, it. It's not. It's not an animal topic. Oh, it's not an animal topic. Yeah. Um, we did two animal related things, so we decided for the third one. What about uh, non animals? Inventors. Oh, that's a good one. So, it, the third one is we're pretty sure that it's going to be about space. Oh, I like it. 
Can you put like a sound effect on my voice when I say space? I definitely can. That would be excellent. You can or cannot? No, I can. I absolutely okay. will. Okay. Because yeah. if not, I'm willing to just do the, I can add <laughs> effects on my end. I have a, <laughs> I have a really? voice amplification generator machine Ooh, here. I Hold like on. That. Let me just. Okay. Let's see. Space. <laughs> no, I don't have one. That would be really cool. Well, that was good. Yeah. We'll put that in. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Mike Lowry, thank you so much for being here today. You can purchase everything awesome about dinosaurs and tons of Mike's other books at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It has been great to be here. Thank you for having me. When you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything. As you grow, you'll show this world that you can be anything you could write a book or fly a plane build a house with a giant crane whatever you do one thing will be true there's nothing you can't do you can see it through just by being you thanks for listening to our reading bug author visit series we'll be back with all new story adventures later this spring so be sure to submit your story ideas to us at talkback at readingbugadventures.com. The Reading Bug is a family-owned independent bookstore in California. We are passionate about engaging, entertaining, and educating children with an emphasis on creating personal connections with kids. Please consider supporting us and our podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash readingbugadventures. Shop for millions of books at thereadingbug.com or subscribe to readingbugbox.com for perfectly personalized books delivered to your doorstep every month. Thanks for listening.